On today's episode of the Fighting and Finance podcast, I sit down with Kim Lockridge. She's an expert in cost segregation studies. She's also a real estate investor herself. Her company, Engineer Tax Services, does over 400 cost segregations every single month spread all across the United States. I happen to need one, and so I figured what better way to chat with her than to have her on the podcast. She's also a massive real estate investor. She has over 800 units on rental incomes, as well as gas stations, car washes, self-storage, 16 cannabis facilities, growing, distribution, operations. She's very, very well-versed in all facets of real estate. So I had her on the podcast. I'm hoping you guys enjoy the episode as much as I did. I learned a lot. And if you're interested, we'll leave all her information in the description below. Without further ado, hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Fighting and Finance podcast with Kim Lockridge. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm really excited to have you on. This is a topic that not only I think my audience and my clients would benefit from being a little bit well-versed on, but myself personally. I know I reached out and talked to you about cost segregation and potential office space that I'm looking to purchase, uh, and you gave me some very good advice just on our phone call, so I figured it would be prudent of me to have you on to dive deeper. So. Uh, tell me and the audience, if you don't mind, a little bit about yourself, your experience, uh, and we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks, Farza. I appreciate you having me on the show, and um, I'm, always, I'm always happy to talk about um, real estate. And it's my passion anyway. Um, so uh, my name is Kim Lockridge. I'm currently the Executive Vice President of Engineer Tax Services. We are a nationwide engineering firm that is a heavy tax basis, and we're based in West Palm Beach, Florida, but we have offices all over the country. And our company, uh, you know, focuses solely um, on cost segregation, energy certifications, and research and development tax credits. Uh, we do some other uh, tax credits like, you know, export taxes and things like that, and we do a lot of consulting for companies as they come up, but those are our four core products is the cost seg R&D, uh, 1790 and 45L. Uh, my background, uh, you know, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Um, I've been investing in real estate since the late 90s and uh, have, a, have built a portfolio thanks to the bonus depreciation rules that were expanded in 2017. Uh, my network has, you know, personally grown exponentially, and there's been some really great opportunities that I was able to um, kind of see coming into it just because of the nature of what I'm doing with the cost eggs. I can see trends that a lot of people uh, don't get visibility to. I mean, even people in real estate, uh, because, you know, in our company, we're running somewhere between four and 600 studies a month across the country. When you have that volume of real estate that's tr changing hands, you have a unique perspective of the market. What's coming? What's hot? What's not? What's what's going? Uh, you know, where are the trends? And and what is and why is it happening? You're right. So, uh, as a real estate investor, it translates to me in a different way than it would translate to maybe a business owner that's running just a cost side company, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so the, the investing, um, you know, I didn't start with ETS until uh, 2009. And so what that 15 years now, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So about 15 years ago, I, I started in this space, uh, you know, and, and that was eye opening to me, just kind of learning about uh, the opportunities and, and the benefits. I've always been in finance and accounting. So to me, it was just a no brainer. It just it just clicked. But, um, you know, doing it now and being a partner in the firm and, um, you know, <sighs> looking at this and helping people uh, across the country is, is really my forte. It's been a lot of fun being able to identify and not only talk to somebody as a cost of provider, but talk to them as a fellow investor, right? It, it's not just I'm selling you something. This is an educational, uh, you know, service because it, it takes a lot to understand, you know, the ins and outs of cost seg. And there's a lot of myths out there. So that's, that's kind of a, you know, my background in a nutshell. Beautiful. So for those who may not be well versed on what a cost segregation study is, can you just maybe give us a high level overview of exactly what it is, what it entails, and what the benefits could be for potential investors? 
Yeah, so cost segregation is just a different method of accounting. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, instead of, of filing a cash or accrual basis, right? That, that's a method of accounting. You're either filing on cash or you're filing it on uh, uh, accrual basis. Um, here, you're either depreciating a property on straight line depreciation or you're de depreciating it over the maker's methodology. You, both are just different methods of depreciation. It's kind of like, uh, you know, my kids, uh, if they have a job, they really don't have any deductions, they can file a 1040 EZ, right? Right. Um, and then as you get older and you have deductions and you have kids or real estate that you can take those itemized deductions, it makes more sense to file a 1040 to itemize those deductions. Well, that's what cost segregation is for real estate. Essentially, instead of taking your standard depreciation, or in this example, the standard uh, deduction, you're actually able to break down the different assets of the building and, and separately, and then you're itemizing those assets, which go into different buckets, which gives you more benefit. So it's really no difference. Right now, if you're just filing a straight line depreciation for your property, um, you're just taking your standard deduction. It's like filing a 1040 EZ. And none of us would even think about filing a 1040 EZ with the complexities that we have, right. and most of us can't file it, but, but you understand my drift. Sure. Um, and so assuming someone has a rental property, does it make sense for them to do a cost segregation on one single family home cost segregation? Or is it more uh, beneficial to have different types of asset classes, maybe commercial spaces and within commercial spaces? I think you and I had a discussion on what specific types of properties work best with cost segregation studies. Yeah, um, just one single family home as a rental property is fine to do a cost seg study on and we do that all day long. Um, you know, we have a lot of, um, you know, I have a lot of doctor clients that, you know, are looking to have a second home and uh, they want to turn it into an Airbnb while they're not there and using it for, for personal use. So, you know, it's a it's a great opportunity, and especially with the bonus depreciation rules, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer, you know, to, to be able to do that. And if they're managing it on their own and they qualify for that material participation, then it becomes, you know, even more important. So, um, you know, there's there's just, it, it really runs the gamut. Um, you, you can do any income-producing property can have a cost seg. Any person who owns income-producing property can do a cost seg. A lot of times people say uh, to me, it's like, oh, well, I won't be eligible for the bonus depreciation because I'm not a real estate professional. Like anybody, everybody is eligible for it. Uh, it just comes down to whether or not you can utilize it. And then it runs the whole uh, process of looking at when you could utilize it, right? So there's a ton of different ins and outs of the benefit just because it may not benefit you right now this year or because maybe you have a, a, a passive loss that you, um, you know, you can't use right now doesn't mean that you shouldn't do a cost seg study. There's, there are exceptions to that rule and, and there's a lot of people that are still doing a cost seg study for a tax planning, um, you know, prospectus. Got it. And so if, if you don't mind, let's talk through my personal situation. Um, so I own a home right now that I'm living in. We're moving uh, in the next few months. I'm going to turn this into a rental. I've only owned this home for two years. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously eligible to, to do a cost segregation study on it. But my question is, it would obviously make more sense to do it now as opposed to 10 years from now to take advantage of the bonus depreciation. Is that not accurate? 10 years from now to take advantage of the bonus depreciation. Is that not accurate? Yeah, I mean, you're going to be eligible for the bonus depreciation regardless of when you do the cost seg study um, because it's triggered by the, the year that you put it into service. Um, but we, we, what we're doing in the cost seg study per se is we're rebuilding that building on paper and we're establishing to the IRS what was there at the time it became a rental. Now, if that's the purchase date, great. But in your case, it's not the purchase date. Your, your place in service date is the date that it became a rental. So what condition was it in? Um, what was there? Uh, because that's a unique situation when you have a homestead that turns into a rental where you, know, you get to take the lesser of either the appraisal 
or the purchase plus any improvements you put in. So let's say you bought it for a couple, you've had it for a couple of years and you put some improvements in that while you lived in it, uh, you could actually take the purchase price plus the improvements and add those together for your depreciable basis as rental. And then you have to pull out land. But, uh, you know, if you just bought it as a rental, right, then you would just start it from the date that it became a rental. So Got it. I, don't, I don't know if that helps no, that's, that's answer very your helpful. question, but it's, it's, it's very beneficial. And so I would say do it sooner rather than later so that you can establish that baseline with the IRS to prove what was here at this time, because later you might do some improvements after. Absolutely. And so within those improvements, I guess it would also make sense to maybe update the fixtures in the same year that I'm doing the cost segregation? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, if you do the cost seg study first, you know, um, and, and, and then do some improvements, um, it's really not going to matter because you can do the, the improvements are going to get layered on after it's in service, or if it happens before it goes into service, then we can include it in the study. But that's only a homestead turned rental, right? What I don't want to send the message is that if you do purchase a rental and then you do improvements before you rent it out, you don't want to bundle those together, okay? okay? You only bundle those together if it is a primary residence because the IRS allows us to do that. In a case where you have, um, in the case where you have a purchase and then improvements afterwards, even if they aren't finished until you actually put it in service, that date would be the same, but you want to separate them because you're going to get way more benefit doing it that way than bundling them together. Plus, it'll be a lot harder to unravel that if it's all put in together in one number in three years. How are you going to remember how you got to that number? So it's a little bit, it's better to do it in two separate um two separate things if, if it's not a homestead that turned into a rental, as long as it's just a rental. Okay. And then if you don't mind, walk me through the process. So I give your firm a call. I say, I want a cost segregation study done as soon as possible. What are the next steps in terms of your, your firm doing that cost segregation study? Yeah, I just gather some preliminary information, you know, depending on the, you know, situation, you know, if it's a purchase, the settlement statement and the appraisal, if you have it, um, sometimes if it's paid cash, you don't get an appraisal. So that's not a problem if we don't have it, but a uh, settlement statement first, if it's been a property that's been in service for a while and you've filed your taxes and claimed some depreciation, then I'd like to have the depreciation schedule. But I gather that information, I put together a complimentary benefit analysis and then send that over to you so that you can identify, you know, what the estimated tax deductions are going to be, as well as the fee to do the study. Um, that one link that I send you is also a DocuSign. So if you choose to move forward, you can very easily, or you can set up a call and we can discuss it. Um, but, uh, you know, usually that happens, uh, you know, we have a pretty good turnaround record, uh, you know, within 24 to 48 hours, we can get you a proposal. Uh, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty quick. And then the whole process, uh, once we get started, takes us about six weeks from start to finish. And we do have to have an in-person site visit by our engineer. There's a lot of companies out there that are trying to cut corners, um, but it is required in order to do an engineered based cost seg study that it has to be an in-person site visit by a qualified building professional. And so I assume you have these engineers either spread out across the country or do they travel to each different site to do their studies? Yeah, very rarely do we ever have to travel an engineer. Um, you know, usually our engineers are strategically located to be within a couple hours of any property. So there's no travel, um, travel fees or any additional costs that we have to charge. And within those six weeks, Kim, how often are they actually at the physical location? Yeah, we do one site visit, usually within two weeks after the um, proposal was signed. And, um, you know, I would say depending on the property, right, it's going to be a lot different if we're doing an apartment complex with 100 units versus a single family <laughs> home, right? Right. Um, but, you know, a single family home is going to be like an appraisal. It, it might take an hour or two for the site visit. Uh, very non-invasive, you know, we walk in, we take pictures, we take videos, we take counts, and, and then we go back and re rebuild that building on paper uh, using our technology and our uh, proprietary software that we've built. And then, um, you know, larger properties maybe, you know, depending on the size, it just goes up from there. So maybe a day, maybe two days if it's huge property, you know. Got it. Um, which type of properties do the best in terms of the bonus depreciation uh, for cost segregation? 
Yeah, great question, Farsa. Um, so, you know, number one is going to be tied for gas stations and car washes. Uh, they have special rules, so by far they're going to be they're going to be the best performers. Um, second would be mobile home parks uh, or RV parks, and third would be self storage if it's metal construction. Uh, fourth would be maybe medical office building, medical office space, surgical centers, those types of things. Um, and then fifth would probably be like everything else, <laughs> <laughs> multifamily, you know, office buildings, um, you know, non-metal construction, self-storage, all that kind of stuff would go um, in fifth place. Um, probably the worst performer is just a warehouse, like a, mm -hmm. a storage facility warehouse or something like that, right. but it's still going to perform at 20, 25%. So right. we're still going to get some good returns on that. It's just, you know, not like a car wash or a mobile home park. <laughs> right. Um, and so now I want to talk about, you know, your specific real estate investing journey. So, you know, let me take a step back. So, you know, obviously as a financial advisor, the stock market is where I've built up most of my net worth. Yeah. Um, only recently have I had exposure to real estate and that's just me purchasing my primary residence. However, moving forward, I'd like to try to reallocate my overall portfolio to have a little bit more real estate exposure. I think you and I mentioned our spouses qualifying as real estate professionals. My wife leaving her career as a news anchor and, and taking that qualification so that we can yeah. you know, really take advantage of the tax benefits uh, that come along with it. As someone who's looking to invest in real estate, I'm, I'm, there's a, a few things that come to mind. Obviously, income, uh, appreciation, but for me, uh, because my income fluctuates from year to year, you know, being strategic with my tax alpha is probably where I want to focus most of my concerted effort. Um, from, if you were to advise me, um, if you were to obviously know every th component of my financial situation, and we were trying to go out and purchase real estate in the for the goal of just trying to get as much of a tax write-off as possible. Um, how would you kind of go about that process? What questions would you be asking me? What would you be advising me on? So on and so forth. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's a question that a lot of people um, work the opposite direction. They work it backwards and, and then they get stuck. Um, mm -hmm. So I really appreciate this question. Um, so you can imagine that most people, if they are going to invest for the first time, they're going to buy something they feel comfortable in. You know, maybe they've had a job that was in self storage and like, hey, I'm going to go buy a self storage or something like that. Right. Um, if you've never been in the space then it's foreign to you and it's very difficult to jump into something like that. So most people start with homes. Most people start with second homes or short term rentals or something. I think what's important is um, not to just look at it from the tax aspect, but you also have to look at it from, you know, let's say in this situation we talked about your uh, spouse being a real estate professional you're going to have to get the hours, right? So if you have to claim 750 hours a year of, of active real estate management, you can't just claim like I'm looking for property and that counts <laughs> towards my 750 right. hours. That's not active management. In fact, that's just the same as researching stocks to buy. You don't get credit for researching stocks, right? So that doesn't claim as part of it. So a lot of people think that oh, I'm driving around my neighborhood and looking for properties and like that doesn't count, right? So you have to really look at it from a real estate professional standpoint, what's gonna get you the hours? Um, a long-term, one long-term rental probably isn't gonna get you the hours because once you get it set up and you have a lease per person in there, the only thing you're doing is maybe claiming a, a deposit you know, of rent every month, you know, uh, maybe a couple repairs, but that's not going to add up to 750 hours a year. And the IRS knows that. So you're going to have to make sure that you're generating the enough hours to justify the real estate professional status. If not, then it just separates on your taxes. And this is a passive investment, which is fine too. You can, you can modify it both ways. Um, you have two sides of your taxes. You have your active side, which is your W-2 income and your deductions for your uh, property tax from your 
uh, primary residence, your interests, those types of things that get deducted in that ordinary bucket or active bucket. And then you have the other side, which is your passive bucket, which are your passive investments that you're not actively involved in. Those stay on the other side. Imagine that there's a line in between the two. So you can't, uh, you can't cross that line. So if you have losses over here, you can't offset your ordinary income with it because you have that line. However, if you become the real estate professional and you have that 750 hours a year documented of property management, then that line disappears. And now your passive you know, activity for your real estate is now your active and that gets bundled together with the other spouse's W-2. So that can offset that. That's huge, 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 huge benefit when you're doing a cost of study and you have the depreciation to offset. Um, so with that said, you know, if you reach or you get to the point where you're reaching that 750 hours a year and you have that real estate professional status, uh, you know, then it opens up an entire new world, you know, for, for you. Uh, so being a first time investor, you might be better off uh, uh, getting a short term rent rental, right? Uh, buying house, turning it into a short term rental, um, although there's a lot of them on the market. So I, I you know, I think it's flooded and it's supply and demand, so that might be difficult, but typically you would use that because you don't have to have the 750 hours if it's a short-term rental, which uh, the IRS describes as on average of seven days or less. Uh, so if you, if you actually have that and you manage it yourself, then you only have to prove 100 hours a year. Now that's only a couple hours a week communicating with your guests uh, coordinating cleaning, but you also have to have more hours than any other person works on that property. So you have to have more hours than your cleaners do, you know, so just as long as you meet that, then you can claim, uh, you know, you can claim this as an active income. So it will swap, it will jump over that line that we talked about, um, because it's called material participation. So you can material participate in that activity if you're managing it. So there are a couple of different avenues to get there. Um, and if you're a first time investor, you may end up having to opt into doing a short term rental for, for one or two or three until you start building up enough hours. And then you can start maneuvering some of the real estate around. Um, you know, we, we started out, uh, as you mentioned, my husband's a real estate professional. I retired him a couple of years ago. Uh, and then what happened was, uh, we were able to start with, you know, short term rentals. Uh, we had an office building. There are all kinds of things that we had involved in, but we built up enough hours that basically he could, you know, quit his job and justify the real estate professional status. And then all those deductions offset my W-2 income and, and also the income from the properties. So it, it could be, um, it's not, it, it's not, it could be, it is extremely valuable. I, you know, unlike yourself, started out in real estate and I felt more comfortable with that. And it seemed like every time I would put money in the stock market, it would just, I would lose it. <laughs> so uh, it didn't matter who was managing it. It was just like, this sucks. Um, and so uh, hopefully you do better for your clients, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, it's, yeah. So, uh, so it got, you know, it got me thinking about just really having a little bit more control uh, over my investing and, you know, over the course of, mm, since the late nineties, I've been investing, you know, there's a lot of buying and selling going on, but, um, for the most part, uh, you know, like I said, started out with a couple homes and it just continued to grow from there. And I, uh, 2008, I bought an office building, uh, you know, rented that out, had multiple tenants in there, was managing it myself and, uh, along with my partner who, who's my sister. So, um, we, we did that and then, you know, uh, you know, made some money on that turned around, you know, and just started you'd buying other real estate, you know, long-term rentals, short-term rentals, kind of depending on where they're at, uh, what the market looks like. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, I, I talked about in the beginning, the trends, I, um, I started seeing this trend about 10 years ago and it was, it was mobile home parks. And I hadn't seen a mobile home park come across my desk for a cost seg in like, you know, once a year for like five years or whatever. And all of a sudden in this, in this one year, I got five of them or and then all of a sudden the next year I get like 10 of them. And I'm thinking, what is going on with mobile home parks? I don't understand. And then we started doing the cost segs and delivering them. And I had to literally send it back to my engineering team and say, is this right? 
could this possibly be right that the the results are so astronomical and they're like yeah it's right and here's why and so i got educated on that um you know so that started a a seeing a trend of mobile home parks and so i came home one day from work and i told my husband i was like we need to buy a mobile home park <laughs> he says are you crazy and I said, yeah, I might be, but I, I think I'm, I'm seeing this trend and I, and I see this and I think we need to go into mobile home parks. Um, ended up working very, very well for us. Um, you know, over the course of, of several years, we managed them ourselves. We learned this was one of us jumping into an asset class that I'm not familiar with. So I learned, right? Um, and so, but now uh, long-term rentals, short-term rentals, those are peppered uh, anywhere from, you know, Oregon, uh, uh, Arizona, Utah, Mexico, uh, you know, let's see, where am I forgetting? Um, it, anyways, kind of peppered on it, multiple in each state. And then a couple of them, you know, in Mexico International, which was also a, a challenge because, you know, international investing is a whole different ball game. So we had to learn there. Um, but, you know, then we started, you know, the mobile home parks and then we've got a hostel up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, you know, we've got a gas station in South Carolina because, you know, again, that was one of the highest performers of cost segregation. So of course I had to jump on that bandwagon. Um, so I got myself a gas station. So, uh, you know, multifamily about 800 doors in Texas, um, you know, and then we just became investors. We have about 16 cannabis warehouses in, I would say probably five different States. Um, you know, it just kind of, can it continue to grow from there? So we're, we're really heavy in cannabis. You know, we, we do a lot of cannabis real estate. We're actually investors in, uh, the cannabis, the grow operation, the dispensary. So pretty much every um, aspect of, of cannabis in, in one way or another.